Greetings, everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and I'm faculty here at University of Maryland, and welcome to our Crashing Patient Conference. For those of you that are interested in getting CME credit for the lectures that you're going to see, you can get CME credit on EMED Home. Check it out at www.emedhome.com. And for those people that want live lectures, we're going to be right back here in October of 2013. Hope to see you then. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to talk about a topic today that's come up recently in the toxicology literature. And sometimes we have that issue where we have a crashing patient with a known overdose or suspected overdose at least that's very cardiovascularly and possibly neurologically impaired and we're running out of options. We've gone through all of our standard of care and we're starting to think about things like an intra-aortic balloon pump or maybe even ECMO. And the question is, what else can we do? And that's really what I'd like to talk about today. So I'd like to start with my take home message, and that is that lipid emulsion is a viable treatment option for critically ill overdose patients. And we'll kind of explore that over the next several minutes. This all started for me back when I was a toxicology fellow. And as part of my fellowship, I got the privilege of each month uh, going up to Bellevue Hospital in New York City, taking the train up there. And each month they have a case conference. And what they do is you walk in and you sign in, and there's a piece of paper on it, and it has somewhere between eight and 12 cases and all of them each have just a couple of sentences on what the case is about. So you really have no idea what the substance was that was ingested. You don't know what the outcome is. And the whole goal is to try and get you to start thinking about those. And basically what they do is they randomly pick a couple uh, throughout the course of the next two hours, and they talk about them. And so this was one that I found back in 2007 when I went up to Bellevue. And this, in what's in quotations here, is exactly what was listed on this small sheet of paper. So a 17-year-old girl developed seizures, followed shortly by cardiovascular collapse, about nine hours after ingesting full bottles of bupropion and lamotrigine. Resuscitation is attempted for more than one hour without sustained return of intact circulation. And then an anesthesiologist attending uh, her for airway management suggests a novel antidotal therapy. So this is all we were left with. And at the time, there really wasn't a whole lot of data on this in the toxicology literature. So we were kind of left wondering what, how this case would develop. And here is something, for, some pieces of information from the case because it actually got published a year later in Annals of Emergency Medicine. So this is the patient's EKG six hours after overdose when she presented to the emergency department. And as you can see here, you can certainly see that there is a widening QRS, so certainly signs of sodium channel blockade. And four hours later, you'll see that this is her EKG on arrival in the, EC, in the ICU. Uh, so this is 10 hours now post-ingestion of bupropion and lamotrigine. And you can see now that the QRS interval has widened from 122 milliseconds in the first EKG to 152 milliseconds in this EKG. So you can see that things are progressively getting worse here. This picture uh, depicts what they did for her. So as you can see, she has a blood pressure upon arrival not too long after she gets to the emergency department, she actually loses pulses and the blood pressure. And say, so they employ a lot of standard ACLS care. She gets epinephrine, indiodorone, 11 shocks. And then finally, they give her sodium bicarbonate therapy, which we know should work in a sodium uh, channel blocker overdose. And it seems to uh, temporarily, though. And then she loses pulses again. And as you can see down here, uh, she has this very sustained period of no pulse, no blood pressure. And they try a number of other interventions in the meantime, including more bicarb, epinephrine, calcium, epinephrine fusions, norepinephrine. And then all of a sudden, this anesthesiologist recalls some information from the literature and says, how about we give fat emulsion? And I'm sure everyone at the bedside was thinking, what on earth is he talking about? And they gave it. And as you can see, about a minute after they gave the intralipid, this patient had complete um, return of spontaneous circulation and actually maintained that. Now you could argue, and this is sort of a joke, that you could argue that the dopamine was actually the cause of her having return of spontaneous circulation, but uh, we all know that that probably did not do anything after already having been on norepinephrine and epinephrine for an extended period of time. So that, there you have it. That's the first documented human case of intralipid use in non-anesthetic toxicity. 
So I want to tell you a little bit of another story, and that is back in 2010, so this is three years now after that first case was reported, we were at our annual toxicology meeting, and we had Dr. Guy Weinberg as our keynote speaker. And he is an anesthesiologist that has done tons of research in this area looking at fat emulsion therapy for reversing pupivacaine toxicity, but also other long-acting anesthetic agents that they use in, in his field. And it was funny because he described the story that he actually wanted to get out of the lab completely. He had done a lot of research and really just wanted to focus more on clinical time. And then a case happened that he heard about where a 20-year-old was given bupivacaine and they were known to be carnitine deficient and the patient developed arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. And the thought here is that bupivacaine toxicity may be exacerbated in patients with carnitine deficiency. And he started, the mind started thinking, and he's a lab person, he's an MD, PhD, he's an MD but he has PhD credentials. Um, and he wanted to start studying what this relationship was all about. And so the thought was that if bupivacaine, carnitine helps transport fatty acids into the mitochondria, and, the, and bupivacaine may actually block that. And so the thought was that if you give lipid in this case, it may actually exacerbate the problem and make it worse. So why in these cases were patients actually getting better? And so he went back to the lab and started to do a lot, a lot of research with mice um, and other animals. And it's funny because it's sort of come full circle now, and there was recently reported in the literature a case of lipid being used in a carnitine-deficient overdose patient with bupivacaine. So it's kind of come full circle now with his research. He actually set up a website called lipidrescue.org where you can go and look for any use of intralipid. Um, it has all the cases that come out uh, each month, um, including commentaries and, and data and how to interpret that data and what it means. And he actually very recently just published essentially a commentary, a seven-page commentary in anesthesiology on this very topic, just his experience with intralipid, um, all of the lab, the current thinking on how it works and why it works, and then what the future might hold. So this is a really good commentary to, to read. So since 2006, when the first case of anesthetic toxicity was reversed with intralipid, there have been over 25 um, more uh, in that same field, and now there's been 40, so even more than that, of non-local anesthetic toxicity. So these are cases of uh, amitriptyline, of bupropion, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, whole bunches of different types of drugs, lots of animal studies, and at my toxicology meeting specifically, we have numerous abstracts every meeting uh, describing cases of intralipid use. So the question is, how does it work? And the point of this slide is not to bring us back to our biochemistry days. The point is really just to say that there are probably a lot of reasons why this works. The predominant theory at this point is that it serves as sort of a lipid sink. So if you give someone a high fat load, and we'll talk about the dosing in a couple of minutes, that lipid soluble substances are going to be encapsulated by the, the lipid emulsion and not be available to bind to whatever receptor they were targeting uh, and reduce the toxicity. And that would also explain why the reversal is so quick, literally within a minute or 60 seconds of giving the drug. There's also thought, though, especially with this carnitine deficient uh, link uh, and the research that goes in there, that perhaps that it helps increase fatty acid uptake into the mitochondria that was previous being, being blocked. And finally, there may be some calcium and sodium channel properties along with it that help reverse toxicity there as well. So there's really three primary mechanisms by which we think that it works. One is intravascular. This is with that lipid sink theory. Um, intracellularly with the uh, fatty acid transport and metabolism. And finally, membrane effects with calcium and sodium channels. This is a case report that came out um, about a year ago. And all I wanted to show here is this is a case of verapamil toxicity. And as you can see, the big gray lines are when intralipid was actually given. And you can see on the top line here, this is the verapamil serum concentration. So what they showed is that when you give the intralipid, you rapidly reduce the serum concentration of the verapamil. And what that does is it, it really supports this lipid sink theory so that it's basically taking all of that verapamil and, and confining it within the intralipid. So some of the questions that normally come up is, so I'm giving this dose of fat to a patient, and where does it go? And the truth is that it only lasts a short amount of time. It's really, uh, the half-life is about 30 to 60 minutes. 
And what it really does is it undergoes lipolysis to free fatty acids, which are then um, distributed and used by the reticular endothelial system. So that leads to the question, well, if it's getting metabolized and it's encapsulating the drug that's causing my toxicity, could that patient experience toxicity once the drug wears off? And the answer is yes, uh, that, th that has been reported, although it doesn't seem to be as severe as before the drug was given. Here are just some drugs to think about it, and this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just supported by what's been touted in the literature so far, um, supported by case reports and, and abstracts. They're all, for the most part, lipid-soluble drugs, and so that would go more towards that lipid sink theory of how it works. So think about things for calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, certainly local anesthetics, which is where this was, concept was first born in the first place. And then there are other drugs that are coming out um, to, to think about as well. But I kind of like to think of it in terms of if you have a crashing patient, whether it be neurologic or cardiovascularly, um, and you're, you're kind of exhausting your normal uh, treatment algorithms or even earlier, think about it. So the question becomes, and it's particularly from a medical legal standpoint, is what's the, what are the, the national societies saying about this therapy, and am I justified in using this uh, if I were to get brought in front of a jury? And so here, <laughs> I, I have a question mark after the guidance from the experts, and you'll see why when I, when I read this to you. This is a statement from the American College of Medical Toxicology. So they're the experts in toxicology. Let's see what they have to say. And I'd just like to highlight some of the words that they use. Given the uncertainty of its beneficial effect in human poisonings, it is the opinion of ACMT that there are no standard of care requirements to use or to not use uh, lipid resuscitation therapy. So I guess that means that from whatever angle you use it, you're covered. You can use it if you think it's appropriate, um, but there is not any standard of care uh, to guide us. And then they go on to say, however, in circumstances where there is serious hemodynamic or other instability from a xenobiotic with high lipid solubility, it is viewed as a reasonable consideration, even if the patient is not in cardiac arrest yet. So that's what ACMT says. The AHA, the American Heart Association, says something very similar, and they use words such as it may be reasonable and some papers suggest and proposed. And so again, this is not hard and fast standard of care guideline type stuff that you want to hear, um, but at least it gives us some guidance as to what to use, how to use it, and what the dose should be. There are also similar statements from several of the anesthesiology societies as well. So if you are in that, patient, that situation where your patient is crashing, you're thinking about intralipid, you're trying to convince your nurse to hang a bag of fat and infuse it as a bolus, this is what you need to remember. The dose is a little bit complicated. It's 1.5 mLs per kilo of a 20% fat emulsion, but I just want to take that out of the equation a little bit. If you multiply 1.5 mLs per kilo by, well, what should be a normal 70 kilogram average person. We uh, in Baltimore certainly don't have 70 kilo patients walking around all that often. You'll get about 105 mLs as your dose. They come in 100 mL bags, so give one bag. It makes the math a lot easier. And if that doesn't work as well as you'd like, give a second bag. After you finish the bolus, some providers would say you can stop with that and see how they do. Um, and others would say, if it did work, start them on an infusion, um, and here's the dosing for you if that were to be the case. And obviously, this is the monitoring parameters that go along with this are not specific to the drug. It's really more to the toxin that you're probably dealing with. And so you want to think about things such as blood pressure and heart rate and all of those normal hemodynamic parameters that you should be uh, looking for anyway uh, with your patient. As you can probably imagine, infusing 20% intralipid over one minute it, probably could lead to some side effects. And surprisingly, with all of the case reports that have been out there so far, there really haven't been a whole lot of adverse effects reported. Uh, there can be an allergic reaction if you're giving a high amount of fat over a short period of time. At this last year's meeting um, that I just attended in toxicology in October, there was a case series of nine patients that received intralipid, and two of them developed pancreatitis, presumably from hypertriglyceridemia. Um, there have been some talks about maybe acute lung injury or fat emboli, but these have not been borne out in the literature so far. And then, as I suggested earlier, after about an hour, some of that toxin could potentially be released from the lipid um, encapsulation. And so there's the chance that you could have further toxicity if you're not continuing the therapy. Other potential issues, when we give someone a high fat load, 
it has the tendency to interfere with laboratory values. And so any laboratory value drawn within, say, an hour at least of this intralipid infusion is probably not going to help you very much. So if you're going to get labs, try and get them before you give the intralipid. A really interesting abstract came out last year at our toxicology meeting, and it suggested, it, it basically took a bunch of normal resuscitation meds, such as epinephrine and sodium bicarb um, and calcium, and it combined them in a vial with intralipid. And then they measured the stability of those products, and it basically found that virtually none of them were stable with intralipid. And so what that suggests is that you should infuse it in a separate line than your other resuscitation meds. And finally, the question is, well, what if we misdose it? There's actually a case of someone getting two liters of intralipid. And surprisingly, other than having high triglycerides, they did fine. Um, and so there's not a lot of experience with overdose of intralipid yet. Uh, so that's certainly something that would be reportable if, if you do have a case out there. But um, it seems to be relatively safe uh, when given for this purpose. It's hard to say if there's ever a true contraindication to giving intralipid in a case where your patient is crashing. They may be peri-arrest or actually in cardiac arrest. So really, I wouldn't say any of these apply in those specific circumstances, but there are contraindications given um, out there in the literature for uh, avoiding lipid therapy, and that would be an egg or soy allergy because a lot of the products are based from soy. And then here are the other ones that are listed as well. So I just want to leave you with this statement, and that is that you should think about lipid emulsion therapy early in the crashing patient, not necessarily because you're going to give it early, but just think about it so that you can get your team on board. Because one of the hardest things is employing a new therapy and getting your whole team involved and on the same page as you because they may be resistant to change and especially resistant to a new therapy that they haven't used before. Um, so start to talk about it early in your resuscitation of an overdose patient if you think you're headed in that direction at all. Um, you may have to get it from pharmacy, so that may add a little bit of time. So just start to think about those things. We actually have it stocked in our uh, automated medication cabinets within our emergency department in case this happens. We also added a care set to our overdose plan so that all you have to do is click the dose. And so that might be something else to consider at your hospitals. And that way, when you actually are confronted with the situation, you don't have to be thinking about doing calculations, and you don't have to think about where it's going to come from. It's all there ready for you to use. Uh, thank you very much.